In a moment, I'm going to introduce three very special people uh, to the podium. Uh, all three are on the leadership team for the development of this project, uh, which is very close to launching. Uh, but I wanted to just say a few words of introduction about Now What New Hampshire. So Now What New Hampshire is a campaign, if you will, to make New Hampshire more sustainable, more livable, more accessible to residents of all ages by encouraging residents with diverse viewpoints, uh, backgrounds, and life, life experiences to serve on their municipal land use boards. Our partners in this campaign are many, including New Hampshire Housing, uh, New Hampshire Office of Planning and Development, 603 Forward, New Hampshire Municipal Association, New Hampshire Planners Association, Stay, Work, Play, and more. So it's a, it's a coalition of people and organizations behind this. Now, why do we call it Now What New Hampshire? Well, um, because, and maybe I should put our slide on here, okay? Because um, now what, uh, be, oh, because New Hampshire is a wonderful place to raise a family, but a difficult place to afford a home. Now what? New Hampshire is attractive for successful growing businesses. Now what? Now New Hampshire offers great quality of life, but its economic growth needs a spark. Now what? New Hampshire has quality jobs available, but we don't have enough workers. Now what? New Hampshire has a, a rock solid economy, but can be even better if we allow it to grow. Now what? In short, New now what New Hampshire wants to do three things. Create awareness about opportunities to shape the future of our communities by serving on our community planning and zoning boards. Second, to educate interested community members about these boards and what work would entail should they serve on them. And third, if they do seek election or appointment, uh, to support the individuals on these boards by providing a network of like-minded people who can share their struggles and successes. So as you'll hear in a moment, the need and opportunity uh, for service on these boards is great. And we want to attract people, again, of all ages, race and ethnicity, gender, socioeconomic status, to serve on these boards and help their communities become more vibrant, more welcoming, and more livable. What we're going to need from all of you today is to hear about this campaign, provide some feedback on it in our roundtable discussion. You'll see we have some special questions for you to discuss, and then volunteer to help. We'll have three ways in which you can help us, um, and I'll just preview this, but there's three sign-up sheets that you can maybe sign up during the break or during lunch. One is, if you're maybe interested in serving on a zoning or planning board in your community, put your name down. Um, the second is maybe you'd be interested in mentoring somebody who's in, in your community who might be interested in serving on one of these boards. You could put your name down on that. And third, failing those two, you'll help us spread the word of these opportunities in your network of people uh, in your communities. Um, so that's the third. So we think everybody should be able to put their name on at least one of those lists. Um, okay, but without, um, without more from me, I'd like to invite to the podium three people, uh, Sarah Marchant of the New Hampshire Community Loan Fund, Molly Lunn Owen of 603 Forward, and Nick Taylor of the Seacoast Workforce Housing Coalition. They're gonna to talk to you a little bit more about this uh, campaign. So please welcome them. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. So we're gonna start with a very short introduction and a little stories about our why. Why are we up here and why have we done that? So um, I have had the good fortune to serve in municipal planning and now at the Community Loan Fund for longer than I'm going to say on stage. Um, but housing has become incredibly important and rose to the top of every community I worked in and all of the work we're doing, whether it was employees who I worked with at the city who struggled to afford rent and have stability in their homes, or um, my 20-year-old brother who works for nonprofits and developmentally disabled children who struggles to find a place to rent and is still living with me. Um, so I have some motivation <laughs> behind this. And um, I just wanted to start with, that's one of the reasons why I think affordable housing is so incredibly important um, and why we're here volunteering today. Well, thanks everybody for coming out. I'm Nick Taylor. I'm the executive director of the Workforce Housing Coalition of the Greater Seacoast. I'm also a recently appointed alternate on the zoning board in Manchester. But so our organization in the Workforce Housing Coalition, the Greater Seacoast, we're a nonprofit that works in Stratford County and Rockingham County, providing technical assistance, education, and community engagement with communities. We originally started out of concerns of employers who couldn't find the workers, 
um, to keep their businesses going, to work that extra shift, to stay open um, that extra day. Um, and that was in the early 2000s, right? So we are still grappling with many of the same challenges. But one of the things that we're so excited about this is because we, again, still hear those same challenges. And you know, so much of this starts and ends with our land use boards. And so by being involved in this, by getting some different perspectives, by continuing to raise this issue up, you know, we'll be able to help those employers. We'll be able to you know, answer the calls when people are reaching out to us and telling their story and saying they really need a place to live. And we could say, you know, you're not missing anything. It doesn't really exist right now, right? There's not a secret website that you can go and find. And so by hearing those stories, getting into this work, we know so much of this does start with the land use boards. And that's why we're so excited for the center to take this on and for, you know, to be involved and for all the partners that are doing the great work here. Thanks, Nick, and good morning, everyone. My name is Molly Lun Owen. I serve as executive director of 603 Forward and the Forward Foundation, and I'm also on my local planning board in Manchester. Um, 603 Forward is a is a nonprofit um, organization that helps young people run for office, and the base of our work is teaching people how to advocate for pro next generation policies. So that could look like showing up at the state house or showing up at your local city council meeting to advocate for housing policies, for example. Um, but we also, I, I most recently after this recent election, we can brag that 125 of the people serving at state and, state and local office in New Hampshire were trained by 603 Forward or recruited by them. So we're pretty proud of that um, in terms of our goal to, is to make the state a more representative place. Um, by helping folks under 50 to, to learn about serving in office and, and actually seek elected office themselves. Um, for the Forward Foundation is a nonprofit 501c3 organization. We engage in research and education. Nick actually serves on our board. Thank you, Nick. Um, to facilitate a, a place, make the state house a place where young people can serve, for example, through legislative reform to to create conditions where working parents maybe have childcare options during the day. Um, and also we work with local elected officials on governance in a nonpartisan way to teach them how to be great elected officials and, and how to do that job while generally having you know, paid work on the side like most of us do. Um, my, the reason I'm here in this room is probably because of my work on the planning board. I'm the only woman and the only renter on the Manchester planning board, and we don't have any individuals of color, despite, um, you know, a lot of work on our chair's part and past chair's part to try to make our board more diverse. That's kind of part of the reason that that I'm engaged in this initiative is because um, I'm, you know, we, we have a, a small child and another child on the way, and been saving for 10 years and still can't afford to buy a house. Um, despite our dual incomes, my husband is in the military and also works as an engineer with BAE. Um, it might help if we didn't have $32,000 a year in childcare expenses coming up. Um, so, so that's, uh, you know, one of the barriers that we're not here to talk about, but the biggest barrier I think is accessibility of, of housing and the people who make those decisions at a local level are our land use board members. So um, we have a, a sh very short presentation talking about what this initiative looks like and why we need more, why more diverse land use boards would be valuable to the housing landscape in New Hampshire and, and help folks like me and the folks in this room and the folks in our families afford to find somewhere great to live. Great, thank you. So we're gonna, um... We're going to start with a little exercise. I'd like, um, I assume most of you in this room know who might be on some of your planning boards. Does anybody know who serves on the planning board in your local community? Just know a name or something? All right, awesome. So I'd like you to get a picture in your head of your planning board members. And if you don't know, envision what you think a planning board looks like, right? So with that vision in your head, I'd like you to think about um, the percent of our population between 25 and 44 is over 30%. How many of those members on your planning board represent our 30, our 25 to 44 year olds? One. One. All right. So those are first time home buyers. Those are our families. Those are our, our the, the majority of our workforce. They're actually the majority of our population. It's actually about equal to all of the people who are 45 and over in New Hampshire. And the majority of the people who sit on our boards are 45 and over. So that's one of the reasons we're here today talking about the reality of representation on our planning boards. Um, the average family income in New Hampshire ranges across the state, say um, average median income from 84,000 to 115,000. So that's a median. How many of those members are maybe below the median on that planning board? 
that's a good question. Um, I, I this is I don't have a good answer. What do you think? <laughs> Yeah, so that could be a really good part of that lower part. They're representing that voice of fixed income as well. But those are some of the reasons why we really wanted to look at who's on our land use boards and how did we get here where we are through policies. We've actually gotten exactly where we wanted to go um, by our zoning ordinances or by how they were written. So how do we look at changing that and how do we get different voices in the mix? I see if we can switch this. The other huge factor here besides diversity, just a basic lack of diversity is vacancies. Um, I think we have quite a few planners in the room here and you'll all kind of feel this, but out of all the planning board seats in the state, we have 45% of the planning boards have at least one vacancy, excuse me, <clears throat> some many vacancies and the same with zoning boards. Over 56% of boards in the state have vacancy. And this is a huge thanks to those interns Max referred to earlier today, who really had to dive into all this data. So what does this mean? Why is this really a problem? Why is it important that we start looking at this? With a vacancy, we have amazing volunteers who are carrying an extra heavy burden because they don't have enough people to spread it around on. It also means less voices involved in each decision. When a town sets the number of board members, they're looking for a diversity of voices. They're looking for people to have come from different backgrounds, different ways of life to help make decisions on not only development review, but to really lead in our master planning, to lead in the long-term planning of our communities. And when we have vacancies, we don't have a full representation available. And thirdly, it's also a struggle to get a quorum. And if you don't have a quorum, then you're pushing off every application for yet another month to the next meeting, to the next meeting. And that has huge costs in delaying the housing process. It has huge costs in moving things through the process and is, is generally a, another problem. And so we have amazing volunteers on all these land use boards. And what we want to do is to help get some other amazing volunteers out there. So that's a big part of what we're doing here and why we're doing that. And I think with that, um, the goal is to provide, again, is to help, as Max kind of talked about, is we're looking to help fill these vacancies. Um, we're looking to educate people about the real importance behind the land use boards, what they do and how they serve. And we're looking to create a peer resource group that they can learn from, talk to each other about, um, with Molly and Nick on new boards, right? Being a new board member is not easy. And there's a lot of people who've been on these boards for a long time and you have tough decisions before you. So having an advocacy group that you can talk to yourselves and learn from, and also to connect with amazing people who've been doing housing work or any kind of planning and zoning, land use work, conservation, water across the state, um, to be able to connect them to amazing mentors like you who will hopefully sign up on those sheets over there. So that is where we are started, and I'll turn it over to Nick to talk about implication. Right, so this program is about so much more than just housing. It is about the water and the conservation committees and conserving open spaces and all, all that. But we are at a housing conference today, so we're going to talk a little bit about the implications of housing for this. Um, so, you know, as many of you know, coming in with the record low vacancy rates, the rents rising by 25% over the last five years, you know, record low supply in housing, for sale housing, you know, you know all this, right? And so we're going to continue to talk about this, but that's your foundation. But we're still seeing a disconnect, right? You go to different board meetings, we hear about it. You know, there are still housing projects that make a lot of sense for a lot of our communities. They fit the community, you know, it respects whether it's Manchester or one of our more rural communities or somewhere up north, but they're still being rejected, right? And so you're starting to think about why is some of this happening? Where is that disconnect between how some of our land use boards are acting or interpreting some of these decisions and the need of the state. And you know, this is all about bringing those new voices into it because you have a lot of land use boards that are doing a great job. They are tackling this head on. They agree there's an issue. They know how to work on it and they are adjusting their land use regulations to fit that need and to fit the smart growth for their communities. You also have some boards certainly out there that are rejecting pro proposals because they don't want change. Change is hard, right? And then there's kind of that third category that, that I think this project really 
um, has a tremendous potential for is bringing in those different perspectives of people that don't really have that hands-on relationship with what the housing market is going through right now. Like Molly said, there's very few renters on our land use boards. There's very few first time buyers on our land use boards. There's very few people that live in manufactured housing on our land use boards. And so those diverse lived perspectives are so valuable to when you're making these decisions. The vast majority of our land use boards are people that have, you know, have purchased their home. Maybe they have paid off their mortgage. You know, they haven't been in the housing market recently. And that doesn't mean that they're acting necessarily out of ill will or saying, you know, hey, we don't want the next group to come along, but it's just a different lived perspective that is really important when you're making these, making these tough decisions. And so there is gonna be great work at the state house and you know, from New Hampshire Housing and Housing Action and the great legislators that are in the room, but ultimately there will still be a lot of decisions that come down to local land use boards. There's interpretation that has to go with any decision. There's unforeseen circumstances that come up. You know, you're dealing with thousands of decisions over the course of a year. And so by having those different lived perspectives, by having those different voices on our boards with those diverse perspectives, it's gonna make that uh, you know, conversation so much more fruitful and the ability to address some of these challenges with their lived experiences. Um, and so you know, that's, that's what we are so excited about and why we are so excited about, like Sarah said, those, those sheets, getting people engaged, getting people involved, getting people you know, to sign up and work with their communities, work with new members, be that sounding board, um, because if we're going to tackle this housing crisis and the housing shortage, it is going to take everybody. It's going to take a lot of different perspectives. It's going to take you know, work on the lending side and the financing side. It's going to take work at the state house, and it's going to take that local land use board work. And you know, for this and this discussion that we're going to have today at our tables, it's really focused on that local piece. Is how can that local land use and zoning boards play a role, you know, in addressing the housing crisis here? And again, this isn't, you know, about taking away rural character or any sort of parts of the New Hampshire that we love. This is about realizing that strong communities have diverse housing options and their land use boards is a huge part of that. So again, thank you for participating in this. We are really excited about the feedback we're gonna to get today and the continued conversation um, and, and just couldn't be more excited to launch this project. Thank you, Nick. And in a moment, we're going to click through just some of the, the top lines of the website so you can see what the Now What New Hampshire website will look like and where it will house this project. But before that, uh, my, my role is to speak to what the gap is between knowing there are vacancies, not just for bodies and seats, um, but also some diverse perspectives, to actually helping or encouraging or facilitating folks to serve on land use boards. What's, what's the secret sauce? What's missing? Uh, for the past three years in my work with 603 Forward, we've been trying to figure that out at an at a elected level um, generally, but for appointed land use boards and elected land use boards as well, what's missing? In my experience, um, I would say it's awareness, accessibility, and confidence. So awareness is knowing that there are vacancies. It's knowing what the heck a planning board does. <laughs> or a zoning board, it's knowing that the work on those boards will actually make a, a physical difference in the lived experience and the life experience of people in your community. I can bike around Manchester and say, oh, I advocated for those four street trees. Maybe the developer didn't love that idea, but they agreed to it. And I'm really proud of that because it's providing shade for my daughter as she walks along the sidewalk. Um, so it's, it's knowing it's important, but also in knowing what it does. Um, the accessibility is how will that you know, I maybe I know as an individual that a land use board is important. How will it fit into my life? And how much time will that take? Do I need any special education? I don't have a background in planning. I went to college for, you know, whatever it is, someone, or maybe they didn't go to college. Um, and that's a diverse perspective that we need as well that is probably underrepresented. Um, but it's also um, the accessibility of, of walking into a room and feeling like you belong there. I think there's not a huge number of, of people in your general average public who would be comfortable showing up in a room where they where they don't feel welcome, where they might not know what's going on and and where they are not sure that their participation is is valued. So so there's that accessibility of not only is it is it easy for me to access. Um, for me, the planning board has been you know two days two days a month, roughly a couple hours. I'm able to ask a friend to watch my daughter in the evening or if my husband's not not working, he's able to help. Um, and so we think land use boards are, are 
potentially really accessible, but but how do we show that in the mentorship component of this program? We're hoping can can build some community and show people that there are others like them in these roles and they're able to make it work and they're able to make an impact. Uh, but finally, the confidence is the one that we talk about the most at, at 603 Forward actually. And what um, my colleague who runs our prospective candidate recruitment program says most people are, are grateful for. He does a lot of one-on-one -on -one coachings and I do some of those too. And it's a lot of it is like, okay, all right, I know what this role does. People have told me I should serve. I have the time. I can figure it out, but you know, I'm not sure I'm good enough. How do we get over that barrier and say, yes, your community needs you. You are. I think that's the mentorship. Um, and, and that also is just, you know, having, having some materials and having some community to, to, fall back on when sometimes these decisions are hard. Luckily, I, I, I don't think the planning board has been particularly political, but I know that there are communities where you walk into a grocery store and I've had friends on planning boards and they say, oh gosh, everyone's upset with my decision on so-and-so signage and building up the confidence to be you know, uh, confident in the opinions that you have and the decisions that you make and and your your views that you're representing the community in, in those decisions. So we're hoping to impart some of those, those skills and values on the folks that we work with to build these more diverse boards. Um, I think that it's my role to click through the slides, right? Okay, so can I go back? Did we, we skipped one. Okay, there we go. So this is our, kind of our landing page for the program. We have some, some great images of various types of housing throughout New Hampshire um, that we've been working on fitting into the, into the website. We wanted it to be not too text heavy, but also have enough information about land use boards to, to get someone interested. And um, if you don't have a huge amount of time to feel like you, you know what you're getting into, but you also know how to reach out for more information. Um, talking about our program itself, I, I, we won't need to read all the words. I'm just gonna kind of click through it quickly. Um, trying to connect land use board service to making a difference in local communities, because that's that's the key here. It's It's so local that, um, that's you know a unique aspect of serving on these sorts of boards compared to other elements of public service. Um, talking about why land use matters, the idea of if you ask your average you know family member at holiday dinner what is land use and why does it matter, might not be the most exciting conversation. We're trying to make it exciting and trying to make it matter. <laughs> talking about some of those opportunities and how some are elected, some are appointed, what those might look like at an individual level. And, and specifically what they might look like at various levels of, of service. We didn't cover all, uh, I guess, committees. There's conservation committees, there's, um, there's you know, historic committees, of course. Um, so we're not able to cover all of them, but trying to hit you know, the, top, the top ones that might make a difference on the housing landscape in particular. And then of course, how do you get involved? What's, what's the connection point between my interest and my serving in a community? Often it's talking to the chair. Um, how do you get in touch with the chair of these various committees? The, um, the center is hoping that we can serve as a facilitator to make those connections between interested board members and the folks who make those decisions or tell them about running generally up in upcoming town meeting day elections in March, April and May across the state. And this is our information to get to get in touch. Thank you so much. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir, Brian. Oh great. Oh, that's okay. I forgot the question. <laughs> Do you want me to repeat what you said to get started? Why we're oh, there we go. All right. Hello. All right. Good. <laughs> Um, yeah, my question is, you mentioned a lot of the constraints and you mentioned the underrepresentation of 24 to 44 year olds. And you also mentioned all the activities they're doing, raising a family, working, et cetera, right? Uh, do you address anywhere or could you speak to time commitments and constraints uh, that, that could contribute to um, putting people in a position where they feel comfortable accepting the commitment? Yeah, I, that's a great question. So one of the things we want to do is be upfront about the commitment of time that's going to be involved. Um, I think we had said 10 to 20 hours a month you're going to spend on this if you do that. And so it's it's not an easy choice. 
But there's a lot of people in that age group who find the commitment to community a really important part of what they want to spend their time on, and they want to do it in a way that is really effective. And so our goal is to kind of connect that need with this is an incredibly effective way to, to be part of the future of your community that a lot of people are very unaware of at this time. So um, I think I can leave it to these guys to talk about some of the commitments they already do. And that's the idea of the mentorship program as well, is to be honest and upfront. Um, to be able to say to people how much of a commitment it is. And it will vary, right? If you're a, a board member in a very small town, it might be very different than a commitment in a big city, but it will also vary over time as the different um, development comes in or whether you're in a master planning process or different kinds of things like that. Yeah, and we hope one thing we've addressed um, in planning this project is how the time commitment might change depending on depending on the nature of the applications that you're seeing, but also on your level of experience. So for me, my first year on the planning board spent a lot more time reviewing applications because I, I had to understand everything that was involved. Now I can spend a little bit less time. And there's a reason folks serve for many, many years. It just becomes second nature to them. And there's nothing wrong with that. But how do you educate someone that the time commitment might be not consistent, but is, I would say, manageable a few hours a night, a um, couple times a month has been very accessible for me. And we're hoping that that we can educate people about that as well. And the only other thing I'll add is why we're so excited about the mentorship and sort of pipeline program is that there's a lot of people out there that don't even know who to ask that question to, right? So they know that they want to be involved in some way, but who do you talk to if you are wondering, what does this even look like? Could I do it? And that's part of what we're hoping to set up here is that you could fill out that form and say, hey, I live in you know, X community. I've been thinking about this. I don't know anything about it. Could we get coffee and just talk about it? And there you can ask some of those questions. And maybe the answer is, hey, this isn't feasible for my life right now, but it gives you that platform to sort of ask those questions, which doesn't always exist depending on the community right now. Just going to add in the other part is resources, right? Um, the Office of Planning and Development has a ton of training resources. Um, we, through this process and all the work the interns did, we have contacts in every community. So we can directly hook you up with the planner or with the regional planning commission or with the chair if there isn't that. There's also the ability up front to explain to you about the process, about what it is, because in some of these, these are elected positions and in some they're appointed. What does that even mean, right? And so how do you get through the door? And so that's a big part of this is to connect you directly with the resources of the people who do speak this language and who do know this process as well. And we're really hoping that existing land use board members become part of this as well because they are the best mentors out there, right? Um, in many ways about welcoming you onto the boards. Now, <laughs> I've been waiting. No. Um... You guys are doing this is very important work. And I think having all of our community uh, sort of broadly in our community service be performed by people that really represent the entire community. It's a big issue in our government. It's a big issue on our boards. One of the things that I think would be really helpful um, is storytelling. Because for a lot of us, it's like, well, what does a planning board do? You say it's not, it's not like, it's not sexy at dinner or whatever. You know what? It, it can be. If the story, it, I mean, I'm serious. This is this is cool stuff. When when you can tell stories about what happened when something, you know, a planning board was confronted with a certain problem. What are the positive results? What did that mean for a community? The trees on the street, the playground, the dog, the dog park. Those are great stories. And they really enrich that sense of service and giving back to the community. I think that would be a feature of something like this that could be really, really compelling. That's a great idea. You should also write that down in the discussions that we're going to have in a little bit as well. But that is an excellent idea. We love that. Thank you. Any other questions or? Mm -hmm. So Sarah, Molly, Nick, thank you. Uh, you have inspired me as my town's uh, planning board chairman to think about how to do things differently to make my board more accessible and welcoming. And I think that there's an opportunity there for you too, not only to mentor uh, prospective members, but to mentor existing board chairs about how to make changes to how they run things, how they set up 
the tables and chairs in a room to make it more welcoming, how uh, to position themselves to be more open to different types of members uh, coming to them. I think there's an extraordinary opportunity here and the need is even more extraordinary. Yeah, this is fantastic. Thank you for what you guys are doing. I, in all of the meetings that I've been to, um, one of the things that you touched on is, is there a way between the training and Molly, you had mentioned the confidence building. Um, what I hear from a lot of people who would like to have a bigger voice in their community in this way is having some sort of a primer before even training to demystify a lot of the jargon and the word salads and just that whole part of it, because people don't just necessarily maybe lack confidence, but, but it's very intimidating for a, a lot of people that there are people on these boards who are in real estate there, who are developers, who are landowners, and they know the ins and outs of this stuff. And so the ability sort of in the middle to have just sort of a primer to, to deconstruct and demystify um, you know, I've been at this for like 15 years and I still can't make sense of a lot of it. Um, that would be really helpful too, to just sort of break down that that sense of knowledge barrier. And once you overcome that, a lot of this is pretty straightforward. Can you do this here or can't you do this here? You know, we're we going to do this or not. Um, but just as opposed to a lot of other, um, I, I know a lot of other uh, uh areas of life have their own jargon and their own thing, but it's, it, it seems particularly intense when you talk about planning and zoning and land use boards, some sort of primer or something that eases people's concerns. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Part of our partnership on resources is to, is to do that. And I actually think some of the, the, um, the bill that Alyssa was talking about, the toolbox bill very much goes towards training um, and broader trainings that way as well. But um, right now there are quite a bit of resources out there, but say maybe they're an hour and a half long videos. Um, and so what we're going to be trying to do is to break it down into smaller pieces, short videos that are easily consumable while you're you know, running through the neighborhood or waiting in line somewhere, but also um, yeah, like those basic data dictionaries. It, it's easy. It's basically a foreign language, right? And so how do you translate that foreign language in a way that you can consume quickly and maybe reference to? So thank you. That's a great idea. And that is part of the next steps in this launching path. And I'll add, I think one of the reasons why we're so excited about the broad coalition that is working on this project is because we're able to tap into that incredible knowledge and incredible resources that are out there, whether it's you know, some of the municipal associations, great resources, Office of Planning and Development, and others. There is a lot of stuff, like Sarah said, that is out there. And by casting that really wide net with this coalition that want to work on this, bringing people in, working with the Planners Association, working with so many smarter people than me, <laughs> right? And and I don't want to say us because that's not, that's not <laughs> fair, I can say. <laughs> But, but bringing them all in and being able to have that big table that's able to you know, distill some of this complex information into things that is really digestible and can sort of take you up that like 101, 201, 301 ladder as you're learning about what it's like to serve in one of these boards. <laughs>